This is my favorite event of the year. Um, I love this gathering. I love hearing some of the voices of this brilliant and amazing community give voice to poems they love. And uh, we will get right to it. But I wanted to begin by remembering uh, one of our uh, one of our readers. Um, it was a very wonderful moment and probably the most crowded in the history of this place when uh, Czesław Miłosz read his poems in this room last. I'm just back from Krakow and his funeral. It was an extraordinary event. Thousands and thousands of people on the village square, on the town square in Krakow. Uh, a uh, high mass in the basilica with uh, a, a cardinal, four bishops, military honors beneath the altar carving of uh, that is the most exquisite work of um, Gothic art in Poland. Um, the soprano for the Krakow opera sang the requiem mass that filled the room. Lech Valencia was there, all the figures from Solidarity, Adam Michnich spent that time in jail fighting the, he was the Martin Luther King of the Solidarity Movement. Um, the young, now old, very beautiful actress who recited one of Cheslov's poems in Men of Marble, the poem by Andre Vaja, when she, this rather glamorous creature, played a young working girl in the shipyards of Poland at the time of Solidarity. It was an amazing event. People thronged through the streets. The right wing was threatening to boycott because uh, the right wing newspapers said Milos's poems were anti-Polish and anti-Catholic. Um, I could imagine Czesław would have been really delighted <laughs> saying, they mean not anti-Semitic, he said. Uh, the Pope sent a telegram, uh, or the Vatican sent a telegram with an old letter of the Pope's to um, the w Polish newspapers, and it was there in all the papers on the morning of his funeral, which squelched the right, which probably also would have made Czesław very happy. As the th throngs were going through this medieval street in a procession with the coffin to the place where he was to be buried, I heard one old woman shaking her head on the corner. She's been kind of crushed against the wall. She said to her friend, I don't know why they're making such a fuss. They say his poems are anti-Polish. And the other woman said, yes, but the Holy Father forgave him. <laughs> Here's Chesov. A few lines of his from his long poem, uh, Treatise on Poetry, that remembers the situation of a night watchman on the night of August 31st, 1939, the, the evening before the uh, Nazi invasion of Poland. A beautiful night. A huge, lambent moon pours down that light that only happens in September. In the hours before dawn, the air above Warsaw is utterly silent. Barrage balloons hang like ripened fruit in a sky just grown silvery with dawn. On Tomka Street, a girl's heels click. She calls in a half whisper. They go together to an empty lot overgrown with weeds. The watchman on duty, hidden in the shadows, hears their soft voices in the bedding dark. I don't know how to bear my pity or how to find words for our common plight. A little prostitute and a worker from Tomka, before them the terror of the rising sun. Later, I would ask myself more than once what became of them in the coming years and ages. Czesław Miłosz, who will be remembered around here for a very long time. Our first reader is calm. Uh, Nyun, I hope I'm saying, did I get it right? Uh, she's a graduate student currently teaching Vietnamese in the South and Southeast Asian Studies program. Uh, 
She was raised in Hanoi. She's translated several books from Vietnamese to English. She's also translated books from English into Vietnamese, including Charlotte's Web. In 2003, she and her husband, Assistant Professor Peter Zinnemann, recently published a widely praised translation of a novel by Vu Trong Phong entitled Dumb Luck. The Los Angeles Times named it as one of the best books of the year. She's also the co-author of Two Cakes Fit for a King, Folk Tales from Vietnam. Please welcome her. I'm going to read two um, of my favorite poems in Vietnamese, and uh, I will have uh, my friend Ben Chen from the Comparative Literature Department to help me with the English translation. Um, so here you go. The first one, uh, his name is Ông Đồ Già, uh, the own calligrapher by Vũ Đình Liên, translated by Huỳnh Sang Thông. And uh, this poem is consider um, it was written in 1936 and it was considered the poem that sealed the own traditional life of Vietnam and opened a new life and you can see it through the content when Ben read the uh, English translation Mỗi năm hoa đào nở lại thấy ông đồ già bày mực tàu giấy đỏ bên phố đông người qua bao nhiêu người thuê viết tấm tắc ngợi khen tài Hoa tay thảo những nét như phượng múa rồng bay Nhưng mỗi năm mỗi vắng người thuê viết nay đâu Giấy đỏ buồn không thắm mực đọng trong nghiên sầu Ông đồ vẫn ngồi đấy qua đường không ai hay Lá vàng rơi trên giấy ngoài trời mưa bụi bay Năm nay đào lại nở không thấy ông đồ xưa Những người muôn năm cũ Hồn ở đâu bây giờ? So I think the translated version will sound a bit different. But we'll, we'll, we'll have to go ahead. The old calligrapher. Each year, when peach trees blossomed forth, you'd see the scholar, an old man, set out red paper and black ink beside a street where many passed. The people who hired him to write would cluck their tongues and offer praise. His hand can draw such splendid stroke. A phoenix flies, a dragon soars. But fewer came year after year. Where were the ones who'd hire his skill? Red paper, fading, lay untouched. His black ink caked inside the well. The aged scholar sat there still. The passers-by paid him no heed. Upon the paper dropped gold leaves, and from the sky a dust of rain. This year, peach blossoms bloom again. No longer is the scholar seen. Those people graced a bygone age. Where is their spirit dwelling now? The second poem's name is Phương Sa, Far Away in Translation. Uh, it is written by Vũ Hoàng Trương in 1940s, and it was considered by many Vietnamese as expressed the spirits of many lost souls as um, in the mid-century and many Vietnamese American, when they have to, left, uh, have to leave the country in 1975, uh, feel a lot of association with this poem. Phương Sa Nhổ neo rồi, thuyền ơi xin mặc sóng, xô về đông hay giạt tới phương đoài, bể vô tận giữa phương trời cao rộng, cô đơn cay đắng họa dần vơi. Lũ chúng ta lạc loài năm bảy đứa, bị quê hương ruồng bỏ giống nòi khinh, bể vô tận xá gì phương hướng nữa, thuyền ơi thuyền theo gió hãy lênh đênh. Lũ chúng ta đầu thai lầm thế kỳ, một đôi người u uất nỗi chơ vơ, đời kiêu bạc không dung hồn giản dị, thuyền ơi thuyền xin ghé bến hoang sơ. Men đã ngấm bọn ta chờ nắng tắt, dâng buồm cao cùng cao tiếng hò khoan, Gió đã thổi nhịp răng chiều hiu hắt Thuyền ơi thuyền theo gió hãy cho ngoan Far away Anchors away O oh boat Please let the waves push your frail hull And drive us east or west Far from land Between the sky and sea our bitter loneliness may slowly 
ebb. We here are five or seven, all lost souls. Our fatherland rejects, our race disowns. Why take our bearings on the boundless sea? Go with the wind, O boat, and drift away. We wrongly picked the age in which to live, where men forlorn, bewildered, steeped in gloom. A puffed up world will bide no simple soul. O boat, stop at some humble port of call. The wine has taken, let's await dark night. We'll hoist the sails as we all cry, heave, ho. The wind has risen, wafting in the dusk. O boat, submit and yield, go with the wind. When not researching the molecular thermodynamics of phase equilibria, got through that, professor of chemical engineering John Prasnitz writes poetry. He's been a professor at Berkeley since 1963. John Prasnitz is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's published approximately 650 journal articles. His many honors include honorary doctorates of engineering in both Italy and Germany. Please welcome John Prasnitz. I want to read three poems. The first and second are classics, probably well known to many in the audience. I expect that the third, not yet well known, is likely to become increasingly popular. The first poem is by Walt Whitman. It appeals to me because while I love my work in science and engineering, I am painfully aware of the limitations of rational inquiry. Much of what I truly know comes from other sources. That to me is the essence of Whitman's poem entitled when I heard the learned astronomer. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs of figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts, the diagrams, to add, divide, and measure them, when I, sitting, heard the learned astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon, unaccountable, I became tired and sick, till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical moist night air, and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. The second poem is by Rainer Maria Rilke, one of the great German poets of the early 20th century. Rilke died in 1926. The title is Archaic Torso of Apollo. Rilke is in a museum where he contemplates the remains of a statue of the Greek god Apollo. The statue is a relic. It has no head and no knees. This poem indicates how we can supplement the insufficient knowledge that we obtain from science. It affirms how we can speak, how art can speak to us silently, but with shattering intensity. The translation is by Stephen Mitchell. We cannot know his legendary head with eyes like ripening fruit. And yet his torso is still suffused with brilliance from inside like a lamp in which his gaze, now turned to low, gleams in all its power. Otherwise, the curved breast could not dazzle you so, nor could a smile run through the placid hips and thighs to that dark center where procreation flared. Otherwise, this stone would seem defaced beneath the translucent cascade of the shoulders and would not glisten like a wild beast's fur. Would not, from all the borders of itself, burst like a star. For here, there is no place that does not see you. 
You must change your life. You must change your life. The last poem is by a contemporary Welsh poet, Sheena Pugh, spelled P-U-G-H, who was born in 1950. It is not yet a classic, but uh, I suspect that it may become a classic soon. I frequently read this poem to myself, especially after a bad day, when so many things have gone wrong, when the frustrations of life seem to be unbearable. The recorded menu on the telephone leads nowhere. The bank statement is incorrect. The dentist's bill is inflated. The secretary misspelled my name for the third time. The new water tank leaks. The research proposal was not funded. The outrageous candidate was elected to political office. The desired library book is missing. And inevitably, the computers are down. At such times, Sheena Pugh's poem provides perspective and encouragement. The title is Sometimes. Sometimes things don't go after all from bad to worse. Some years green thrives, the crops don't fail. Sometimes a man aims high and all goes well. And people sometimes will step back from war. And people sometimes elect an honest man. And people sometimes decide they care enough that they can't leave some stranger poor. Sometimes some men become what they were meant for. Sometimes our best efforts do not go amiss. Sometimes we do as we are meant to. The sun will sometimes melt a field of sorrow that seemed hard frozen. May it happen for you. May it happen for you. Barbara Erter is the curator of Western North American flora at the university's Jepson Herbarium. After growing up in the sagebrush and ponderosa pine of Idaho, her interest in Western floristics, I like that word, floristics, was solidified by being part of the group that discovered the botanical treasures of Leslie Gulch in eastern Oregon. Her ties to California include a 49er great-great-grandfather. She currently chairs the Rare Plant Scientific Advisory Committee of the California Native Plant Society and is working on a renovation of the University and Jepsum Herbaria, a 10-year process. She writes that Pont <laughs> Potentelier Rosaceae are my current obsession. Ursula Le Guin um, is actually my favorite author, more for the uh, fantasy and science fiction she writes, and I realized she also has written lots of poetry, and it carries many, I realized the fantasy is kind of much the same thing, of a way of stretching your mind, saying well-known things in a different venue, and I could see that carry over in picking out some of the poems that I have. Um, start out with just a short one. Oh, also, I've tried to choose botanical-themed poems when possible. <laughs> um, consider. Industrious and diligent, the lily toils to spin its white shirt out of dirt, light, and water. A wise field worker, it fools the Bible. <laughs> Taking things from a different point of view and saying, let's give credit to the plants. Um, another one of her poems, uh, a longer one that I just seem to fit within the theme. I think the house might like this too. Appropriation. Is it appropriate that a woman mourn a bird? A fledgling acorn woodpecker in a hole in the old elm over the picnic table. All week we watched the adults come and feed it, heard it fizzing and wheedling, learning to purr, louder every day. Took a picture of the small, alert, black, white, and red head looking out. Yelled and threw stones at the stellar's jay that came to kill it shrieking. Winged the jay, but didn't save the fledgling. So that's the story. The parents, relatives, the little tribe that had looked after it, never came back to the elm. They stayed up in the oaks, up on the knoll, flashes of black, white, red, the dipping flight, calling and purring, many conversations. Birds don't mourn. How can a human being cry for a bird 
In a world where children suffer in terror, species die daily, men bomb undefended cities, torture, prison camps, dead forests, a world of enormous sorrows. It is out of all proportion. I mourn in my proportion for one death, not wrong, not out of nature, a life-size death. My grief, sharp as a knife the first night, is dull, small, long, aching for words. So I name this death as birds do not, and women do, appropriate it, make it my own, the little one that had no chance to fly. The second poet um, that I chose has to do with um, one branch that I've been involved in lately is I've had the wonderful opportunities to do some botanical exchange um, with Iran and been meeting some wonderful people there. Um, just got back May, June from our third trip over there collecting plants, establishing scientific collaborations. And as many of you I'm sure are aware, um, Iran is definitely a country of poets. Uh, my first trip there, you know, the number one thing was going to the tomb of um, Omar Khayyam. Um, I understand now actually Hafiz is probably the most beloved poet for Iran, so I felt that was the most appropriate poet to select for a reading. Um, I'll point out, by the way, that on some of the trips to Iran, definitely a gift-giving country among the gifts that I took was collections of poets of Robert Haas. So <laughs> I figured, hey, poets to poets. Um, and I'd originally planned on using mostly um, recently translated The Gift uh, by Daniel Ladinsky, and I will do one short one out of here. Nice botanical. How did the rose ever open its heart and give to this world all its beauty? It felt the encouragement of light against its being. Otherwise, we all remain too frightened. Very nice. Unfortunately, I then found out that you can't make direct connections between this and some of the original Farsi so much. Um, so I decided I would also use a Hafiz poet um, that is a little bit closer to the um, complicated gazelle form that Hafiz used. Um, I was even thinking of originally trying to um, do it in both English and Farsi, but uh, I'm not, my Farsi is not yet ready for prime time. So um, instead, you'll get treated to the translation by um, Edward Henry Palmer, a Victorian Orientalist. Um, and the title of this poem and translation is The Lesson of Flowers, How Could I Resist? Twas morning, and the Lord of day had shed his light o'er Shiraz towers, where bulbuls trill their lovelorn lay to serenade the maiden flowers. Like them, oppressed by love's sweet pain, I wander in a garden fair, and there to cool my throbbing brain, I woo the perfumed morning air. The damask rose with beauty gleams, its face all bathed in ruddy light, and shines like some bright star that beams from out the somber veil of night. The very bulbul, as the glow of pride and passion warms its breast, forgets a while its former woe in pride that conquers love's unrest. The sweet narcissus opes its eye, a teardrop glistening on the lash, as though twere gazing piteously upon the tulip's bleeding gash. The lily seemed to menace me and showed its curved and quivering blade, while every frail anemone it gossip's open mouth displayed. And here and there a graceful group of flowers like men who worship wine, each raising up his little stoop to catch the dewdrop's draft divine. And others yet like Hebe stand, their dripping vases downward turned, as if dispensing to the band the vine, wine for which their hearts had burned. This moral that is mine to sing, go learn a lesson of the flowers. Joy's season is in life's young spring, then sees like them the fleeting hours. Thank you. Classical poetry as well as diary language are H. Mac Horton's areas of expertise within the field of pre-modern Japanese language and literature. He's the translator of 10 Japanese books. He has also written three critical studies, Song in an Age of Discord, the Journal of... Socho. Socho. Of, this didn't print out right from the web. And Poetic Life in Late Medieval Japan, and another forthcoming book, Traversing the Frontier, the Scylla Envoy Poems in Manyosho. It's the practice in the humanities nowadays to view experience as being culturally conditioned. Uh, and that's certainly true. And we're, I think, increasingly uncomfortable using the word universal. 
But it remains true that there are certain elements in life that are common to all people and all cultures. And the three poems that I've chosen to read today all deal with one of those universals, separation from loved ones by death. The first is a verse from Japan's earliest extant anthology of vernacular poetry, Man Yoshu, or 10,000 Leaves, compiled in the 8th century CE. The verse is entitled, Longing for a Boy Named Purupi. It's actually one long composition followed by two codas, or envoys. It's attributed to a courtier of uh, Korean descent, actually, uh, Yama no, We no Okura. He lived from 660 to 733. The translation's mine. The seven treasures so sought and esteemed by the people of this world, what are they to me? My child, Purupi, a pearl, born from the union of my wife and me, stayed under the covers of our bed in the brightening morn beneath the morning star. And whether we stood up or sat back down, he'd play with us. And when evening came beneath the evening star, he'd cry, let's go to bed. And taking our hands, he'd say, mother, father, stay with me. I will sleep between you and we'll make a three-branched tree. And while he spoke so charmingly, I grew confident, as if in a great ship, of seeing him grow up, for better or for worse, in years to come. But suddenly an ill wind arose and enveloped him. And knowing nothing else to do, I hung a white prayer cord around my neck, took in my hand a polished mirror, turned my face to the gods of the heavens, and bowed in supplication. Then I lay down, touched my forehead to the ground, and lifted up my voice to the gods of the earth, saying, whether he lives or dies is at your pleasure. Thus I agonized and pleaded and prayed. But not for a moment did his illness abate. He grew weaker and weaker, and day by day he spoke less and less. And when his life, his vital spirit ceased, I leapt up and stamped my feet and cried out, threw myself down, beat my breast and sighed, then let fly away the child I had held in my arms. Such is the way of the world. Here's the first envoy. He is too young to know the way. Let me pay you, O messenger of the underworld, to carry him there on your back. The second envoy, I lay down alms and prayed thus, lead him not astray, but guide him straight along the road to heaven. The second verse I'm sure is familiar to most of you. Uh, it's by Ben Johnson on the same theme, and it's called On My First Son. Farewell, thou child of my right hand and joy. My sin was too much hope of thee, loved boy. Seven years thou art lent to me, and I thee pay, exacted by thy fate on the just day. Oh, could I loose all father now, for why will man the lament the state he should envy? To have so soon escaped worlds and flesh's rage, and, if no other misery, yet age. Rest in soft peace, and, asked, say, here doth lie Ben Johnson, his best piece of poetry, for whose sake, henceforth, all his vows be such as what he loves may never like too much. The last poem is another long elegy long in Japanese, short by English standards, and two envoys, returns to 8th century Japan, and it deals with the death of a member of a mission from Japan to the Korean kingdom of Shila. It's a particularly resonant theme for Americans today. The man died on an island between Japan and Korea, far from both his home and his destination. It's addressed to the dead man, who's referred to as my brother, here meaning a, a close friend or a comrade. I'll read a few lines in classical Japanese. Sumeraki no to no mikado to karakuni ni wataru wagase wa iebito no iwae matane ka tadami ka mo ayamachi shiken. And it goes on. It's really one sentence. I've translated the poem like this. You, my brother, who set out for a foreign land 
as a distant envoy of our sovereign, did your home folk fail to keep the rituals? Or did you yourself err in your deportment? For you told your nurturing mother that by autumn you would return, but time has passed. The months have come and gone. And though your home folk must await you, wondering, will he come today? Will he come tomorrow? It is far from that remote land and distant too from Yamato, by the deep-rooted cliffs of a rocky isle that you make your shelter. Here's the first envoy. You who make your shelter in Iwatano Field, if your home folk ask me of you, what am I to say? And the second one. You parted from us, saying that this is the way of the world. Am I now to go on yearning, but to no avail? Thank you. Our next reader is Amy Kautzman, who's currently the head of research, reference, and the collections department at Doe Moffitt Libraries. Amy Kautzman has also worked in numerous departments and libraries at Harvard. Her articles span many topics relating to information technology and library science. Please welcome Amy Kessman. I'm going to begin with Ted Kuzer. For those of you who haven't heard about him, he's a poetic voice for rural and small town America. This is my little shout out in identity politics for us Great Plains people. This poem, Selecting a Reader, gave me comfort as I searched for the appropriate poem to begin this with, and it's for two reasons when I realize that poets are just as anxious about who will read them as we are sometimes about reading them. And also, it's such a great um, Nebraskan attitude in that Kuzer starts out with a little bit of an ego, but he quickly comes to terms with the reality of what he has control over. Selecting a reader. First, I would have her be beautiful and walking carefully up to my poetry at the loneliest moment of an afternoon her hair still damp at the neck from washing it. She would be wearing a raincoat, an old one, dirty from not having money enough for the cleaners. She will take out her glasses, and there in the bookstore she will thumb over my poems and then put the book back upon its shelf. She will say to herself, for that kind of money, I can get my raincoat cleaned. And she will. <laughs> so, okay. Makes me feel a little better. <laughs> Okay, the second poet I'd never heard of until I began searching for poems to read, and I, I actually am liking him a lot. I might have to go back and explore him. His name is El Zoinus. I believe that's how he pronounces his name. He's an Austrian of Lithuanian descent who teaches in San Diego. And this poem speaks to the magic of teaching. It's called Love in the Classroom for My Students. Afternoon, across the garden in Green Hall, someone begins playing the old piano. A spontaneous piece, amateurish and alive, full of simple, joyful melody. The music floats among us in the classroom. I stand in front of my students, telling them about sentence fragments. I ask them to find the 10 fragments in the 21-sentence paragraph on page 45. They've come from all parts of the world. Iran, Micronesia, Africa, Japan, China, even LA. And they're still eager to please me. It's less than halfway through the quarter. They bend over their books and begin. Hamid's, li Hamid's lips move as he follows the torturous labyrinth of English syntax. Yoshi sits erect, perfect in her pale makeup, legs crossed, quick pulse minutely jerking her right foot. Tony, from an island in the small South Pacific, sprawls limp and relaxed in his desk. The melody floats around and through us, in the room, broken here and there, fragmented, restarted. It feels mid-eastern, but it could be jazz or the blues. It could be anything from anywhere. I sit down on my desk to wait, and it hits me from nowhere, a sudden, sweet, almost painful love for my students. Never mind, I want to shout out. It doesn't matter about fragments, finding them or not. Everything's a fragment, and everything's not a fragment. Listen to the music, how fragmented, how whole, how we can't separate the music from the sun falling on its knees, on all the greenness from this moment, how this moment contains all the fragments of yesterday and everything we'll ever know of tomorrow. Instead, I keep a coward silence. The music stops abruptly. They finish their work, and we go through the right answers, which is to say, we separate the fragments from the whole. And then this last poem, it's rather obvious, but I, I kind of had to go there. Allen Ginsberg, 
This poem was written in 1963. It's one of his earlier works and it, it matches parts of my weekend activities and it's a welcoming poem to Berkeley for people who may have just come. A Strange New Cottage in Berkeley. All afternoon cutting bramble blackberries off a tottering brown fence. Under a low branch which is with its rotten old apricots miscellaneous under the leaves. Fixing the drip in the intricate gut machinery of a new toilet. Found a good coffee pot in the vines by the porch. Rolled a big tire out of the scarlet bushes. Hid my marijuana. Wet the flowers, playing the sunlit water each to each, returning for godly extra drops for the string beans and daisies. Three times walked round the grass and sighed absently. My reward, when the garden fed me its plums from the form of a small tree on the corner. An angel thoughtful of my stomach and my dry and lovelorn tongue. Thank you. Elaine Kim is a professor in Asian American Studies and Associate Dean of the Graduate Division. She served on the President's Commission on Women in U.S. History. In addition to her Berkeley PhD, she was awarded an honorary doctorate in Humane Letters by the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Much of her research analyzes the experiences of Asian Americans and their images in the media. Her work includes a collection of oral histories entitled East to America, Korean American Life Stories, and a 1992 documentary she co-produced entitled Sa Igu, From Korean Women's Perspectives. Please welcome Elaine Kim. I'm going to read uh, an excerpt from a poem by Lee Young Lee. Lee Young Lee was born in 1957 in Jakarta of Chinese parents. His father was a personal physician to Mao Zedong while he was in China and relocated his family to Indonesia where he helped found a university. But the Lee family fled Indonesia in 1959 because of the anti-Chinese sentiment there. Eventually they settled in the US in 1964. I chose an excerpt from Persimmons because I think it's beautiful and because it speaks to me very personally about beauty, blindness, and invisibility. It celebrates the strength we can derive in the here and now from what an immigrant parent knows and remembers from an unrecognized elsewhere. In sixth grade, Mrs. Walker slapped the back of my head and made me stand in the corner for not knowing the difference between persimmon and precision. How to choose persimmons? This is precision. Ripe ones are soft and brown spotted. Sniff the bottoms. The sweet one will be fragrant. How to eat? Put the knife away. Lay down the newspaper. Peel the skin tenderly, not to tear the meat. Chew the skin. Suck it and swallow. Now eat the meat of the fruit. So sweet. All of it to the heart. Other words that got me into trouble were fight and fright. Fight was what I did when I was frightened. Fright was what I felt when I was fighting. Mrs. Walker brought a persimmon to class and cut it up so everyone could taste a Chinese apple. Knowing it wasn't ripe or sweet, I didn't eat but watched the other faces. <laughs> My mother said, every persimmon has a sun inside, something golden, glowing, warm as my face. Once in the cellar, I found two wrapped in newspaper, forgotten and not yet ripe. I took them and set both on my bedroom windowsill, where each morning a cardinal sang, the sun, the sun. Fully understanding he was going blind, my father sat up all night waiting for a song, a ghost. I gave him the persimmons, swelled, heavy as sadness and sweet as love. This year, in the muddy lighting of my parents' cellar, I rummage, looking for something I lost. My father sits on the tired wooden stairs, black cane beneath, between his knees, hand over hand, gripping the handle. He's so happy that I've come home. I ask how his eyes are, a stupid question. All gone, he answers. Under some blankets, I find a box. Inside the box, I find three scrolls. I sit beside him and untie three paintings by my father. Hibiscus leaf and white flower, two cats preening, two persimmons so full they want to drop from the cloth. He raises both hands to touch the cloth, asks, which is this? This is persimmons, father. Feel the wolf tail on the silk, the strength 
the tense precision of the wrist. I painted them hundreds of times, eyes closed. These I painted blind. Some things never leave a person, a scent of the hair of one you love, the texture of persimmons in your palm, the ripe weight. Thank you. Ray Lachey is a professor of architecture and received the university's Distinguished Teaching Award. His books include The Dervish Lodge, Architecture, Art, and Sufism in Ottoman Turkey, and Design for Independent Living, which received an American Book Award nomination. Professor Lachey sponsors the Berkeley Undergraduate Prize for Architectural Design Excellence, an annual essay competition. He also teaches a two-semester course in narrative writing in the College of Environmental Design, which qualifies for English department credit, so if you're still looking. <laughs> Even with teaching, serving on the Disability Studies Board and focusing on his research on post-revolutionary arts in France, Ray Lachey sometimes finds time for poetry. Please welcome him. Uh, as I was uh, coming over, the sounds of uh, New York City were in my ears. Um, and so I, I, I would like to uh, offer these two poems as uh, our Berkeley protest of the day. Uh, the first is um, Wilfred Owen, Dolce Decorum Est. Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards the distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of disappointed shells that dropped behind. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smoldering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face and hanging face like a devil's sick of sin, if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the forth with corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie, dulce e decorum est pro patria more. The second is uh, Denise Levertov, Life at War. The disasters numb within us, caught in the chest, rolling in the brain like pebbles. The feeling resembles lumps of raw dough weighing down a child's stomach on baking day. Orilka said it. My heart, could I say of it, it overflows with bitterness, but no, as though its contents were simply balled into the formless lumps, thus do I carry it about. The same war continues. We have breathed the grits of it in all our lives. Our lungs are pocked with it, the mucous membrane of our dreams coated with it, the imagination filmed over with the gray filth of it, the knowledge that humankind, delicate man, whose flesh responds to a caress, whose eyes are flowers that perceive the stars, whose music excels the music of birds, whose laughter matches the laughter of dogs, whose understanding manifests designs fairer than the spider's most intricate web, still turns without surprise, with mere regret, to the scheduled breaking open of breasts whose milk runs over the entrails of still alive babies, transformation of witnessing eyes to pulp fragments implosion of skin penises into carcass gullies. 
We are the humans, men who can make, whose language imagines mercy, loving kindness. We have believed in one another, mirrored forms of a God we felt as good. Who do these acts? Who can convince ourselves it is necessary? These acts are done to our own flesh. Burned human flesh is smelling in Vietnam as I write, in Iraq and Afghanistan as I speak. Yet this is the knowledge that jostles for space in our bodies along with all we go on knowing of joy, of love. Our nerve fil filaments twitch with its presence day and night. Nothing we say has not the husky phlegm of it in the saying. Nothing we do has the quickness, the sureness, the deep intelligence living at peace would have. Thank you. Robert Osserman is perhaps one of the most well-rounded mathematicians you'll ever meet. He's currently the Special Projects Director at the Mathematical Science Research Institute at UC Berkeley, as well as Professor Emeritus of a certain campus in Palo Alto that I won't mention, but he's author of Poetry of the Universe, A Mathematical Exploration of the Cosmos, a book that provides a general audience with an introduction to cosmology. In addition to his mathematical pursuits, he's organized public discussions with a number of playwrights and authors, including Tom Stoppard, Michael Frayn, and Steve Martin. Please greet Robert Osserman. One doesn't normally hear poetry and mathematics in the same phrase, but uh, there are examples, I guess, most mathematicians called on to read some poetry might choose the is one by Edna St. Vincent Millay, whose title is Euclid Alone Looked on Beauty Bare. And the, the concluding phrases are, Euclid alone has looked on beauty bare, fortunate they who, though once only and then but far away, have heard her massive sandals set on stone. Um, but rather than read that, I thought it might actually be more appropriate to read a different poem, which is a kind of a repost or rebuttal to it. This uh, appeared last year on the 55th anniversary issue of the Hudson Review, and it's by uh, Emily Grossholtz. If you don't know her name, she embodies within herself uh, mathematics and poetry. She has five published volumes of poetry, several on mathematics and philosophy of science. And this poem is called In Praise of Fractals. Uh, uh, the, the move from Euclidean shapes to fractals is not unlike uh, the kind of aesthetic earthquake that went from Danish Modern and Mies van der Rohe in the Bauhaus to Frank Gehry and the Bilbao Museum and uh, the Sydney Opera House, perhaps. Uh, I'll, I'll read you just the first, the opening sentence. Euclid's geometry cannot describe, nor Apollonius's, the shape of mountains, puddles, clouds, peninsulas, or trees. Uh, then I decided I wouldn't read that. <laughs> Like fractals, I think it, they're better uh, appreciated by lengthy contemplation in quiet solitude. <laughs> and what I was actually asked to do was simply to read a couple of my favorite poems, and so I decided to do just that. They're two brief poems that have nothing whatever that I know of to do with mathematics, but speak to me personally. Um, there by local Berkeley writer, Hetty Strauss. And the first one is called, I Am. <clears throat> uh, and there's a note after George Ella Lyons, I am from clothespins. I am from the sacred heart of Jesus, buried deep inside a kreplach. I am from jelly donuts after mass, on the way home from shul. I'm from matzah, <clears throat> the Irish soda bread of affliction. <clears throat> I'm wandering in the desert, 
looking for my catechism class. <laughs> I'm from my Bubi in Theresienstadt and my Zeta in Auschwitz. My first Holy Communion dress is stained with bloody magenta borscht. I'm Police Chief Callahan's great-granddaughter. I'm the shiksa at the bar mitzvah, the kike at the communion rail. <laughs> I'm from the Strauss family, 500 years of us in Germany. My Yiddish daddy, the last of his line, got out with his life and the seat of mine. I'm from this man, and the Gentile girl he picked for his Madonna is Mary. I'm from this Mary Culleton. I've got her Irish voice in my throat. I'm using it now and loud to chant Kaddish for them both, to call to them, to myself, to gather us all, all the pieces in one place. <clears throat> <clears throat> Second one is Jews at Rest, Synagogue Retreat, Falora. <clears throat> there is room here for me, a place in this place for us Jews. We leave our shoes in a heap outside the room where we daven together. Imagine Jews walking away from their shoes. No place on earth safe for us it was never wise to scatter our belongings. We had to be ready to leave in a moment. We've all slept with our shoes on these thousands of years. The story of unleavened bread baking on our backs as we fled is etched into our cells. Now, I want to take my time, let the bread rise. I have made my home with you, and together we buy large, heavy pieces of furniture to sit old and gr to sit and grow old on while the bread bakes. Our last reader is Frank Worrell, an associate professor in the Graduate School of Education. He earned his PhD at Cal. He directs Berkeley's school psychology program and serves as faculty advisor to the academic talent development program, where some of your kids might have gone. His research spans both ends of the educational continuum, from the gifted to the at risk, and what each reveals about the other. He designed a groundbreaking program in pre-reading and reading skills for the nation of Trinidad and Tobago, where he hails from. He's also an accomplished singer and conductor of vocal groups and revived the School of Ed Chorus, which he founded when he was a student here. Please welcome Frank. Good afternoon. And I'll try to stick within my five minutes. I know we are running a little late. Um, I'm a, I've come back to Berkeley after being gone for a decade and, um, and when asked to read some of my favorite poems, decided to go back to the anthology that um, I studied in middle school and that I taught from in middle school a decade later um, in Trinidad and Tobago. And I'm, I'm reading a couple brief poems from that anthology that I hope you like. The first is by J.C. Squire, There Was an Indian. There was an Indian who had known no change who strayed content along a sunlit beach gathering shells. He heard a sudden strange commingled noise, looked up and gasped for speech. For in the bay where nothing was before, sailed on the sea by magic, huge canoes with bellying clots on poles and not one oar, and fluttering colored signs and clambering crews. And he, in fear, this naked man alone, his fallen hands forgetting all their shells, his lips gone pale, knelt low behind a stone and stared and saw and did not understand. Columbus's doom-burdened caravels slant ashore and all their seamen land. The second piece is in a lighter vein and as uh, somebody who taught in an old boys school, these are the kinds of poems I often used to get them interested in even wanting to read poetry. An elegy on the death of a mad dog by Oliver Goldsmith. Good people all of every sort give ear unto my song. 
and if you find it wondrous short, it will not hold you long. In Islington, there was a man of whom the world might say that still a godly race he ran when ere he went to pray. A kind and gentle heart he had to comfort friends and foes. The naked every day he clad when he put on his clothes. And in that town, a dog was found, as many dogs there be, both mongrel, puppy, cur and hound, and curs of low degree. The dog and man at first were friends. But when a peak began, the dog, to serve his private ends, went mad and bit the man. Around from all the neighboring streets, the wandering neighbors ran and swore the dog had lost his wits to bite so good a man. The wound, it seemed, both sore and sad to every Christian eye. And while they swore the dog was mad, they swore the man would die. But soon a wonder came to light that showed the rogues they lied. The man recovered of that bite. It was the dog that died. <laughs> the third poem is another sonnet, um, Jamaican Fisherman by P.M. Sherlock. Across the sand I saw a black man stride to fetch his fishing gear and broken things. And silently, that splendid body cried its proud descent from ancient chiefs and kings. Across the sand, I saw him naked stride, sang his black body in the sun's white light, the velvet coolness of dark forests wide, the blackness of the jungle's starless night. He stood beside the old canoe which lay upon the beach, swept up within his arms the broken nets, and careless lounged away towards his wretched hut nor knew how fiercely spoke his body then of ancient wealth and regal freeborn men. And finally, I'll end with one of my favorite poems, An Old Jamaican Woman Thinks About the Hereafter. What would I do forever in a big place who have lived all my life in a small island? The same parish holds the cottage I was born in, all my family and the cool churchyard. I have looked up at the stars from my front veranda and have been afraid of their pathless distances. I have never flown in the loud aircraft, nor have I seen palaces, so I would prefer not to be taken up high nor rewarded with a large mansion. <laughs> I would like to remain half drowsing through an evening light, watching bamboo trees sway and ruffle for a valley wind to remember old times, but not to live them again. Occasionally to have a good meal, with no milk nor honey, because I do not like them, and now and then to walk by the gray sea beach with two old dogs and watch men bring up their boats from the water. For all this, for my hope of heaven, I am willing to forgive my debtors and to love my neighbor. Although the wretch throws stones at my white rooster and makes too much noise in her damn backyard. <laughs> Thank you.